Hi there, I'm Simon St. Lawrence, Strategic Content Director at O'Reilly Media. I'm here at OSCON uh, EU with Mark Bates, who's at Influx. You might know him from markbates.com. He's been talking about giving programmers a, a different way to improve, a, a set of, of techniques that are more fun than our usual go learn this. Um, what, what are the, these five pieces? Um, yeah, so that's a great talk. So, Kind of during my life as a developer and before that my life as a musician, I, I kind of identified there are five steps to really becoming better at whatever it is you do. And that sounds very snake oil salesman-ish. Um, like I should be up on some giant stage with a, you know, a headset preaching. Oh wait, I was on a giant stage yeah, see? preaching these things just yesterday. Um, and so I kind of, you know, kind of looked through my life story and, and these kinds of things and realized that if you practice, you perform, you write, uh, you network, and you share, whatever it is you're trying to improve on, you will become better. It's a lot of hard work. Um, none of those pieces are easy, um, but they will get you kind of there. Well, the first one is something we don't talk about very often in the programming world. We're all supposed to be writing code that goes directly to production and solves the world's problems yesterday. Right. Um, Music obviously has a very different approach to this. You spend piles of time practicing, or you're supposed to, as my lack of progress in trumpet <laughs> demonstrates. Uh, how, does, how does that fit into a programming world? Um, that's a great question. You know, you, you have to practice. Coding is a skill, right? It, it's something that needs refinement. Um, you know, no one just sits down unless they're like a Martin Fowler or Douglas Crockford or something on day one and are amazing. <laughs> you know, we're none, none of us are kind of at that level. Um, there might be people, I don't know, but I'm certainly not one of those people. Um, you know, I found that over the years to get from novice to advanced and, and just to keep growing and to keep um, being interested in what I do, um, practice is a huge part of that. Um, you know, you could just go in and do your nine to five coding and then leave, and all you've kind of done is refined a single problem set um, in a single language or a single framework. Um, but you're not growing as a person. You're not growing as an individual or as a developer. You need to, to step back and you need to say, I'm going to take some time and practice my craft, just like a musician would, just like a chef would, just like anybody who's refining a skill would do. It's no different. Employers don't always get this. No, they don't. <laughs> no, they don't. Uh, you know, I, I love companies that do like that kind of 20% type of thing where it's, you know, go and find something interesting to work on. Because that does, that improves morale uh, for employees and for developers, but it also gives the developers a chance to grow and push themselves beyond what their day-to-day -day tasks are. And as your developers grow and become better developers, you now have a team of better developers. Like, it's, a, it's such a, I don't, I don't understand why people don't do it. It makes such an investment in your own company. Well, in a company context, it, it seems like, when I, when I think of musicians practicing, I think of two different things. I think of the individual working on the instrument and getting those, those skills down. And then I think of like the band or the orchestra right. gathering. And can, can companies, create kind of joint practice? Can people come together and do this? Sure, it's called peer programming. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's already a name for this. It's peer programming. Uh, and again, more companies should do it. I, I absolutely love peer programming. I recently had an opportunity to pair program with Pat Shaughnessy, mm. um, who is just amazing. Um, wrote Ruby Under a Microscope and uh, just amazing developer. And him and I have very contrasting styles. And it was really fun to work. I'm very kind of cowboyish. I like to just throw stuff at the screen, very visual. So I just throw a bunch of code at the screen and then look at it and go, okay, let's move this around, let's push this around, whatever. And he's very methodical and he thinks about every line and it, he doesn't really type until the line is perfect in his head. So he, you know, he was very slow, I'm very fast and we kind of, you know, I kind of pulled him along and he slowed me down. And we ended up with some just really amazing code for the project we were working on. Uh, but I learned so much out of it. I just, you know, that, that take a deep, taking a deep breath, slowing down a little bit, and kind of thinking a little bit more before I start throwing stuff at the screen. It was just kind of, it was really, really fun. Well, it, it seems like pair programming is both an opportunity to work with someone and to watch someone. Right. And that's a, a different model than many of us grew up with, where you weren't supposed to share your answers or it was cheating and <laughs> right. stuff. So how, how, how can people get into that feeling, that comfort zone? Uh, it's, it's hard and it's awkward at first. I, I think uh, I didn't have too much of a problem with it because, you know, I play in bands and 
you know, I'm used to, like I said, there's two types of practice for me. There's going home and sitting there with my guitar and, you know, rehearsing the songs by myself and <laughs> really refining my part. But then there's also having to work with a group dynamic um, and make sure that I'm locking in with the other members and stuff. Mm. So I didn't have too much of a struggle with it, but I think it's not easy for a lot of people, definitely. And you just gotta just, just do it and just trust that the person you're working with might also be feeling the same yes. way. It might be their first time peer programming. It's gonna be a little awkward and it's gonna be a little weird. You know, it's gonna be like, you know, your kind of first date in high school. You don't really know what to do. You know, you go into the pizza parlor and, you know, do, do you buy your an ice cream afterwards? You don't know, like, you just don't know. And it's just awkward and weird, and, but have fun with it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, trust that the other person you're pairing with, you know, is going to be a nice person and they're not going to jump all over you right. and if, if they are then find somebody else to pair with you don't want to pair with somebody like that so you have you've talked about practice mm. and we're, we're doing this together we're learning these things then you've got programmers shifting to a more public stage right. they're, they're bringing their stuff forward hopefully they've polished it things mostly work <laughs> um, even if they don't it's still important to share Yes. And that's yes. one of the things I definitely I talk about. The, the, the rest of your cycle, the writing, the sharing, all of this seems to be building on this core of solid practice. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of it is, you know, take the stuff you've been practicing on. And, you know, in my talk, I kind of give a few practical examples because just somebody up there saying, you should practice is not helpful. You know, right. so I, I kind of talk about, you know, build your own open source libraries, um, you know, write little apps for yourself. Um, you know, I remember the story I tell is when I first started learning Java, and when it was very early on in my career, and so I built an app for everything. Um, and my family got the brunt of this. <laughs> uh, we used to do a movie night every two weeks. We would all get together and we'd watch a random movie. Somebody would pick a movie. So I built a website where everybody had to register mm -hmm. and sign in and upload all their movie titles to it. And then it would schedule the night. It would send out an email to everybody saying, this is the night and this is the movie we're watching. And it was picked by whoever, random, you know, kind of random selection. And my family used to, you know, joke about BatesMovieNight.com. <laughs> they, you know, I was being forced. And then Christmas rolled around. I was like, well, I got this great gift list site we all have to use. <laughs> you know. um, but it was just right. a way of, like, just practicing my craft. It was just learning different techniques, right. different frameworks, getting stuff out there. Um, if you don't have those apps, mm -hmm. uh, I recommend building other people's apps. Like, so build Twitter, build Facebook, mm -hmm. kind of emulate those things, kind of as breakable toys. You'll learn, so you're, you're never going to release your Twitter clone and become the next Twitter. How many of those blogging systems built in Rails as a demo ever saw light? Oh, my God. Hopefully not very many. But, <laughs> I um, really hope not a lot of those. But, but the other thing is you've I moved. I built one, though. You, you, were <laughs> you were mentioning Java. I think of you for your CoffeeScript work. Just That's where I ran into you. You're also right. in Go now. How does, how does this cycle work as you shift through the languages? Are you um, So what ends up happening is when I start a new language, so I mean, I did Java for a long time and then Ruby for about 10 years and then you know, Go for the last couple years. And like I said, in between that is CoffeeScript and JavaScript and Objective-C mm -hmm. and Swift and you know, all, the, you know, all the languages you expect. Quite a collection. Yeah, yeah. Right, <laughs> exactly. Um, I find I end up building the same apps repeatedly. Um, and I've talked to a lot of you know really experienced developers who have gone through you know many languages over their career, and they do the same thing. They they have a couple apps that they kind of build the same app every time, just to kind of get a feel for the language, and say like, well, I wrote this as I wrote, I wrote this in Ruby. How would I write this in Go, or how would I write this in X language Closure, or, you know, Elixir, whatever. So it's practice that builds on past practice. Exactly, yeah. You know, there's one just, you know, part of that is just learning the language, and it's nice to take that problem set out and say, okay, I already know what my requirements are, and I already know what my problem set is, right? So I can just focus on learning this, the language, the semantics of the language, um, and doing that sort of stuff. That's why I recommend things like build a Twitter, right? <laughs> build a Facebook, right? The problem set's there, it's defined for you. You don't have to worry about that. You know, go and find some code katas out there. And there's, you know, also Dave, uh, Dave Thomas has a great list of code katas mm -hmm. um, that you can Google and just kind of play with those. That's a great way to, to jump into a language or learn, learn that sort of thing. Great. Well, I hope a lot of people will take up your advice and Me too. go out and <laughs> practice and play and figure out new things. Thank awesome. you very much. Great. Thank you very much.